we're working to change that. Tennessee has just passed a law that allows to do that. I'm going to try and do that in South Carolina. Uh, where does certification come from in traditional models from the state? It's based on credentials and the transform model. Certification is local, so superintendents. You get to figure out. You know who the good teachers are. And you know where your shortage areas are. You ought to be able to figure out who you want to hire. And if they don't work out, you replace them. Uh, and you don't need the state to tell you who can go into your classrooms. Uh, evaluations for uh, instructors at most states are kind of informal with mixed implementation. And then the transform model, they're formal and they're linked to compensation. And then compensation in the traditional models based on inputs, degrees, certifications, seniority. And in the transform model, it's based on outputs, student learning, principal evaluations. Got principals here? Yeah, you know who the good teachers are. Peer evaluations, guess what? Teachers know who the good teachers are. Uh, students and parent evaluations. Turns out that all the research shows students have a pretty good idea who the good teachers are. You know, if they were replying the affirmative to the following question. In Mrs. Jones' class, we get down to business right away. That's probably a good teacher. In Mr. Jackson's class, if we don't understand something, he explains it two or three different ways. That's probably a sign of a good teacher. And leadership roles within the school should also be a component of the teacher evaluations. Now, test. A lot of complaints around the country about testing. Too much, too slow, too often. Uh, right now, it's periodically, it's at the end of blocks of instruction, the end of semester, the end of the school year. In the transform model, evaluation is continuous, and in order to progress to the next level, you have to master uh, the previous level. It makes no sense to me that a kid gets a D in Algebra 1 and is allowed to enroll in Algebra 2. We're just sitting, setting the child up for failure. Because the child has not demonstrated mastery of the base material, and now we're sending them on to the second level. Advancement in the traditional model is lockstep. It's based on a seat time and partial mastery, and then the transform model. Advancement is flexible, based on mastery, and can vary by subject area. I don't see why you can't be in sixth grade reading, fourth grade math, and be in the fifth grade. I mean, kids learn different stuff at different rates. And the effects of ability differences in the traditional model, slow learners fall farther and farther behind. Fast learners get disengaged and bored. And in the transform model, students advance at their own pace. Let's talk about how schools recover. In the traditional model, it's top-down and centralized. Federal government gives rules and regulations and policies. Then the state layers on more rules, regulations, and policies. And then the district adds theirs. And then the principal, she or he, they've got their own way of doing things. And who's at the bottom of the food chain? The teacher, the single most important person in the whole system. Uh, I think the policy and the transform model is uh, you use state standards, but it's locally controlled by the teachers and the parents uh, and the community. Too much control coming out of our state capitals and coming out of Washington, D.C. How do we fund education? Well, I know how we do it in South Carolina. We take federal dollars, state dollars, and local dollars and give it to the superintendents. They take what they want and they give it to the schools. Rather than funding institutions, I think in the future what we'll do is fund students and the dollars will follow the child. Now, what you're seeing played out in the policy arena around our country is really a war between two conflicting ideas of education, which I would call the traditionalists and the transformers. The people with the loudest voices and the most powerful lobby groups are, in my view, committed to maintaining the status quo that protects their interests. They want to preserve their jobs by maintaining a monopoly on education, regardless of the various needs of children and the desires of parents. Another thing that makes school reform so difficult is that schools become embedded in people's hearts. 
and this is true in rich neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods, in excellent schools and in poor failing schools. Now, there's lots of examples around the country uh, of where some of these policies that I've suggested have been implemented. Florida probably is the most notable. In 1991, Florida schools were ranked among the worst in the nation. Only Washington, D.C. and Hawaii were significantly ranked lower uh, based on NAEP scores uh, than Florida. <coughs> Uh, last year, Education Week ranked Florida fifth best in the nation, and the American Legislative Exchange Council ranked Florida third best in the nation. Florida's Hispanic students outperform all students in 31 different states because they've been able to increase the confidence level. Other states seeing the enormous improvements in Florida's education have adopted some of Florida's policies. Uh, Oklahoma copied Florida's special needs voucher program. Only about 20% of special needs students in Florida take advantage of a voucher program, but uh, for those 20% of parents who have special needs children, I mean, for that, uh, that makes a huge difference. Uh, Arizona, Indiana, Louisiana, and seven other states have adopted Florida's policy of giving letter grades to schools, A, B, C, D, and F. The impact of that has been that schools receiving letter grades from D and F suddenly have more parental involvement and community support than they ever imagined possible. And the community rallies behind the schools to lift up student achievement. Virginia. Uh, grants tax credits for contributions to scholarship granting organizations so that poor kids in failing schools have an option. At the end of the day, compassion is not about how much money you spend, about, it is about the results that you give. And Florida's results have really been remarkable. Now, as I mentioned, K-12 education is one of the last sectors of American society that has not been fundamentally transformed by information technology. And it has not done what other institutions have had to do to survive, reinvent itself to meet the changing needs of a different customer base. And rather than expect students and parents to adapt to the needs of our existing system, we need to adapt our system to the needs of students and parents. Arnie Duncan, our Secretary of Education, has said as much. And uh, in an address last year, he said, quote, the only side in education that matters to me and our country is the side of students. I absolutely recognize that we want to ensure that our educators are treated fairly. However, at the end of the day, the final lens through which we view reforms must be whether it helps children learn. If the answer is yes, then we must press ahead, no matter how difficult or far or how far outside of our comfort zone it takes us. Now, the traditionalists will argue that the ideas of the transformers will essentially destroy education and our school system as we know it, and will consign children of low income to a dire fate. Transformers will argue public school system as we know it needs to be totally transformed and rebuilt along new lines. Far too many children already have a dire fight, fate stuck in parentally failing schools where zip code is tested. Now, frankly, I'm optimistic about where we are going in education. Nationwide, there is a groundswell of support for reform of what is basically based model of education that's existed in this country for 100 years. Technology is opening new opportunities to deliver customized and personalized education for every student. Other states, Florida, Indiana, Louisiana, Arizona, and other districts, Washington, D.C., and New York City, have embraced these reforms with significant improvement in student learning and results. And finally, I would say education is not a partisan agenda item. It is the only 
policy item where literally Al Sharpton and Newt Gingrich are linking arms and appearing together around the country advocating for reform of our education system. The fact is, given the challenges we face, education doesn't need to be reformed. It needs to be transformed. And the key to this education is not to standardize education, but to personalize it and customize it. To build achievement on discovering the individual talents of every child and to put students in an environment where they want to learn and where they can naturally discover their true passions. Thank you very much. I don't know if you want to take questions or not, Doug, but about five minutes. Thank you very much.
It's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, which will be Dr. Don Martin, who's the superintendent of the Winston Salem for South County Schools. Dr. Martin is a native of Athens, Georgia. He received his undergraduate degree in physics from Duke University, his Master of Arts in Teaching in Mathematics from Duke University, and his doctorate degree in Educational Administration from the University of Kentucky. So when Duke and Kentucky play, I haven't asked him the question, but maybe he'll answer that for us if he pulls for it. His career in education began in 1973 as a math and physics teacher in Wilkes County, North Carolina. Dr. Martin has been superintendent of the Winston Salem for South County Schools for the past 18 years, and that's a huge accomplishment to, uh, to survive a large urban district and to stay out of the newspaper as well as he does. He, he's done a great job there. Prior to coming to Winston Salem, he served in three school districts, two in Kentucky and the Rowan and Salisbury School System in North Carolina. Among his honors, he was named the 2011 North Carolina Superintendent of the Year. He was recently invited by the U.S. Department of Education to present at its conference on advancing student achievement through labor management and collaboration in Denver, Colorado. He has served the past two years as superintendent advisor to the State Board of Education. He and I served on the race to the, the North Carolina's race to the top team, and we go to D.C. about every six months and, and, and meet with uh, Dr. Duncan. Dr. Martin is married and has three grown children and a special granddaughter. Deline Beth, his wife, Rita, is a counselor at North Forsyth High School. And let's stand up and take a little stretch break and give Dr. Martin a standing, a Gardner Webb standing ovation. I'm glad you're here. Thank you, Jack. I was going to suggest the stand up break myself. It's always good to get the blood flowing. It's a real pleasure for me to be here today share the podium with Dr. Zace, and I think I was just listening to his remarks, I think you'll find that I'll bring a North Carolina flavor, a lot of the same, a lot of the same information, North Carolina flavor, maybe a little more granular, because I'm, I'm not the state level view, I'm the, the local district level view, so it's a little, little more, a little more, a few more details. Um, I do want to say that I've known uh, Dr. Urey for over 20 years, um, when I was named the superintendent of Roy and Salisbury Schools, and he was an assistant principal there. I can remember uh, in my office having a conversation with him about sort of sort of growth expectations of he, he wanted to be a principal. I was talking to him and he'd get all the experience that he could get, particularly uh, get some experience in uh, you know, instruction, direct instruction, evaluating teachers and being a part of it. We, 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 we in Salisbury we kind of had administrative assistant, assistant principals and, and curriculum assistant principals. And so we, need, we need to work on that a little differently. Um, he did a great job and I was able to hire him for his first principal's job in the high school. And after he'd been there about a year or two, he came to me and he said, Appalachian State University is starting this doctor program in uh, head leadership. And he said, I'd really like to do it. And he said, boy, the hours are tough in the school board. He said, I'm going to miss probably a, about a day a month, and I'm really going to miss some time in the summer. And, and, and I really liked Doug, and he was really effective. So I said, Doug, let me tell you what. I said, you'll make a commitment if you finish that program. You make a commitment to stay five years in North Rand High School's principal. We'll call it even. You don't have to worry about your days. Finished his degree right on time. He stayed his five more years, uh, plus a couple. And, uh, and then I had an opportunity to hire him again as principal West, uh, at West Forsyth High School. So I got to hire him twice. But then Gardner Witt attracted him in a short period of time. He stayed just one year at uh, West Forsyth. But Doug's a great uh, leader, and he's done a wonderful job at Gardner Witt. And uh, certainly a pleasure to count as my friend. Um, I did want to mention I've been, uh, I'd like to know Dr. David Shelman. He actually worked with us as an assistant superintendent for technology. And uh, he actually called me up one day and said, I really need help, you know, with the split classroom or web. We have, have offices in the classroom in Winston Salem. I said, Well, sure, I'd be glad to do that. And for the last three years, I've pretty much taught something about every semester. I think I've missed one. Um, and it's really been great staff development for me. Um, you know, it's the, you, get, you get to deal with the minutia, the details, and solve the problems. Sometimes you need to step back, read more, and quite frankly, you all know to try to try to teach and discuss things, you basically you learn yourself and you kind of remind people of what you do. And you said, well, is that what I do? That, that's which was really good. It's been a great experience. I've really enjoyed it. And, and uh, I probably, I'm sure some of the students would say that a few practical stories, probably more stories than one. But then again, that's a, you know, that's a, that's a part of learning from other people's experiences. In any case, I told the class, the last group that I was working with this summer, I was going to make these remarks today. And one of the students, Kevin Carney, is here. Kevin, come on 
He's got a stand-up cab. I got to see where you are. I told him I was going to I told him I was going to Paris. But uh, Kevin said, he said, well, are you going to talk anything about, about Gardner Webb? I knew their background. I said, well, you know, quite frankly, I don't, you know, I know some anecdotal stories about Gardner Webb, but a little bit. But to tell you the truth, I really don't know. And I said, I said, I said, Kevin, how about preparing a little history for me? A little something that, uh, you know, that I could use. And so he did. He took the assignment very seriously, and uh, he actually gave me a, a nice little report. I'm going to show you two real quick things. One's funny, one's serious. The funny part was uh, Gardner Webb started actually started as a high school in Boiling Springs High School in 1907. And they actually uh, uh, they actually entered very early and played, actually played the first football. There's a story about the first football game. They had to go find a coach. And the coach had only seen one football game in his life. He had seen the football game. And so they got together. They had no football. They actually practiced with a shoe. They practiced one week and they had played the first game. And so the coach said, he told all his players that all wore five layers of clothes. He said, you put on your long johns, put on your next work shirt, or nothing top of on top of all those five layers. I want you to put on a pair of big old clothes. And so when the players walked out in the field, they posed the team, looked at these gigantic guys. <laughs> they, were, they were terrified. And it turned out that uh, they actually played and they won their first game, but six to nothing. But, um, the serious part, uh, Cabot found a book the book is actually by Francis Devon, and it's called Lengthened Shadows, A History of Gardner Webb, 1907 to 1957, written in 1956. Um, uh, it, it's, and basically, here's a series, there's a quote out of it, I thought it was a great, great quote. It said, in a school that seemed, quote, unquote, destined to fail, the spirit of the underdog has never been strong. Gardner Webb has throughout his history, and especially during his first 30 years, been faced with grave opportunity for economic ruin. Yet the people who are Gardner Webb University have never failed to provide the generosity and ingenuity necessary to stay off them. And I thought about that title, the length of the shadows. I think you can look at Gardner Webb today and say their shadows are pretty long um, because they actually have 17 satellite campuses across the state. Um, they actually serve almost 5,000 students totally undergraduate graduate. If they have students from 37 states, 21 foreign countries, and, uh, and sitting with uh, as an advisor of the state board uh, last year, one of the reports had to do with administrative training institutions. I can tell you that Gardner Webb trains more school administrators in North Carolina than any other institution, public or private, in the state. And I, I actually looked, I tried to find my uh, board handout to get the exact numbers, but it's more than several combined uh, if you put together. So Gardner Webb is very prolific in administrative training. So it's a real pleasure to be a part of the Garden Webb family. In preparing my remarks, I really thought I really have sort of two two talks and, and kind of and, and to make it be a little crisper. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna have two short little speeches. The first one, one short one, the short one is gonna be about charter schools. And and like our state has uh, been a part, we've had charter schools for 15 years. The legislature authorized and set a cap of 100 charter schools. Um, in and, and pretty quickly, we had 100 charter schools, and they've operated uh, you know, kind of under the radar of sorts uh, for that period of time. Now, I can tell you that uh, the charter schools with those 100, they only represented 3% of the students in the state. 3% of the public school students in the state went to charter schools. And it, from the, and from the get-go, as, as legislation many times goes, the actual funding for charter schools is, is, is woefully inadequate in a lot of ways. Um, basically, we get money one way in the local school district by formulas, and then we turn around and give it up in the peoples, and so there's always an inequity. Um, same thing with local funds. And then the charter schools have a legitimate money. They get no money for capital funds. They have no capital support for any kind of buildings. So th that's always been sort of difficult, but quite frankly, nobody spent much time really working on it because it represented 3% of, of, of the school children in the state. So now we're looking at, we've lifted the cap, we had nine fast track charters approved this year, so we have 9% growth already this year. <clears throat> Excuse me, and then we have 60 plus applications to start charters in 13-14. Uh, I'm sure all of them will make it through the process, but we'll have a number of charters in 13-14 on top of that, and I suspect that it will continue to grow. So it, it gets down to part of the issue, I, I have no problem with charters. In fact, and, and just picking up on Dr. Zace's comments, um, it, it, I mean, if we believe that every student wants, we need to educate every student this country and in our state, then with the public dollars in this state, it doesn't much matter 
whether it's in the public LEA or a public charter school, as long as we get the job done. I mean, that's not, that's not the issue. But the point is, I have a couple little issues in our current setup, the way we're organized, that cause me pause. And I think they're all three fixable. One of them is, I think we have very serious problems in access, equal access. I agree that every poor child ought to have an opportunity to go to a charter school. Well, because of the way the funding works in our state, most charter schools do not offer transportation. They do their best. They do not offer food service, so there's no sort of free, free breakfast, free lunch. And special education services are limited at best in most of our charter schools because they have no infrastructure. That brings me to my second point, no infrastructure. I mean, if you think just one moment, think of the best principal in America is hired by a group of people in the charter school to come work. I mean, this guy, Mr. Innovation, Technology, you name it, he's ready to go, he's fired up, the school opens. And on day one, the technology doesn't work because the network fails. Well, he's the principal, there's nobody else to call him. There is no infrastructure. It is one school. So the principal's on the phone trying to find somebody to fix the technology that's going to make everything work. And the next day, the window breaks. And the next day, the, you know, the, the backup in the, in, the, in the sewer system. And they, and they're, they're, in fact, I know a charge school principal in Mississippi said he wears a tool belt. You know, he's got he's to fix stuff. You know, there's things he's got to be taken care of. No infrastructure. You write your own checks, you're handing your own stuff. And then you get to accountability. Any of you know about the test administration process, from the training of test coordinators, and on all that kind of stuff and process and scoring and whatever. It's, it's voluminous and, and test violations, reporting, security. Who knows that and handles that in charter schools? They have, they have no infrastructure that can handle what they need. So that's another issue. And finally, the funding needs to be straightened out. Well, I've actually had an opportunity to, because I was with, at the state board when the nine new charters were approved, and some of the issues that came up in that process were interesting. And I've had a chance to read what's going on in a couple other states. And some of you may know or heard of Ann Call, who is the kind of legislative liaison of the State Board of Education. And she and I said, uh, she, she's an attorney, and, and we've talked on a number of occasions about how this law could be, how our charter school law could solve some of these issues. And literally, I exchanged an email with this weekend. I wrote it on Saturday, um, just talking a little bit about sort of the latest sort of thoughts I've had. So I'm going to this thing, literally kind of what if idea of how charter schools could operate in our state would be much better. To deal with the access is, first of all, having the state be in the chartering entity be the chartering entity is problematic. Because our state essentially has got two people, men trying to manage and support hundred schools. You know, so any kind of problems they have, who are you going to call? Who are you going to get help from? It's very limited. And there is no observation, accountability, or so I really think in South Carolina, I was talking about characterization last night, they actually have local school districts can, can actually be the charter entity. And a number of states have universities, public universities, and public school districts can be the charter entity. I think that makes a whole lot of sense. Then I think when a charter school is approved, and, and by the way, if, there, if the board says it doesn't approve them, that charter should have a right to appeal to the state board, so the local, local board is not being just arbitrary and saying, I don't want to have anything to do with charter schools, we're saying no. Um, they need to have an opportunity to be a, a, sort of a, a, an appeal process. But essentially, if their charter school is approved, then the school district will be obligated to provide transportation and food service and special education services. There are a lot of states that have school districts that basically, they have their special ed services provided by a third party. New York does this in their most cities. They have their special ed services, a lot of their Vocational or CTE services are provided regionally. Um, same kind of thing, which is the school district can handle the special ed services, the transportation, and the food service issues. And they'd be required that they handle it. Now, correspondingly, the money it costs to do that is pulled out. The per people cost of transportation gets pulled out, and that, that kind of money will flow to the charter because the local school district is handling it. On the same thing, if you like testing, the whole testing program, we've got a huge infrastructure for, for assessment. And they just participate in hours and do the same thing, just like transportation. We give them the money for the central office part, and they can decide whether to purchase services from us or not. And the rest of the money, they don't get it. They get it by the same way we get it. Whatever way the state says we get the money, we let the charter school get the money the same way. If, it's a, if you have to have 100, you have to have 100 students and seven teachers to get a principal, that's the rule for the charter. Operate exactly like we are. If you have that kind of opportunity, here's the, and this I think is. Gets to reporting results. 
the charter is now under the big umbrella of the district. Even though they have their own board, they're independent, they have their own budget, they can get, they can get payroll services from us if they want to. But basically, when the student results are reported, these are public school student results, we're all together. All of our results are together. And just like it is now, you can go look at XYZ high school, elementary school, or middle school. You can look at the charter system. You can report them separately. You can do it, but you still have the umbrella. So for Winston-Salem for Scythe County, we bring our charter school kids in our, in our test schools. And in that way, we take a little ownership in those test school kind of issues because we, we want the charter to be successful because they're, in a sense, under that umbrella. And I, I, we're, we're keeping working on that and see, but that's kind of the way that we can make charter schools a lot more of really interested in certain kids there are other ways to make that a bit okay. um, I want to that's, that's talk one now talk two is a little, a little more a little more detail and I, I thought I thought of, in, in, in thinking about it I, I really started thinking about it. I've been sitting there a long time and, and I can remember sitting in my office in a very a very small school district in Kentucky my first job and this is in 1983 and the mail comes it's a big old stack of mail and, uh, and so I'm, I'm just, there's an envelope from the, from the Department of Education. In fact, I actually think it was still the House and Urban Bell, but it was a, a different, different. But anyway, get this, get, no, actually, we actually crossed the Terrence Bell as a secretary of the Department we crossed into the Department of Education. And so I get this, the DOE report. And so I open up this, this envelope, and there's this little pamphlet that is purple, and it says, A Nation at Risk. And I start, I start opening up this little pamphlet and start reading it. It's, it's extremely well written. So I, I was literally, I was thinking about it when, it a couple weeks ago, I went to the internet and pulled up the Nation of British Point. Literally, it's a PDF copy of the, uh, of the little pamphlet that I opened. Um, and, and, and I actually just made a copy of the first page and read about four or five sentences. And, and I want you to get this in context. This is April 1983. The educational foundations of our society are presently being eroded by a rising tide of mediocrity threatens our very future as a nation and a people. What was unimaginable a generation ago has become has begun to occur. Others are matching and surpassing our educational attainments. If an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performances that exist today, we might well have viewed it as an act of war. As it stands, we have allowed this to happen to ourselves. We have even squandered the gains the student achievement made in the wake of Sputnik Challenge. Moreover, we have dismantled essential support systems which helped make those gains possible. We have, in effect, been committing an act of unthinking, unilateral, educational disarmament. Back in the 80s, disarmament was a big word that was used a lot in political issues. That's power, those are pretty powerful language. That's 1983. Next year, that'll be 30 years ago. That's, that's a hard to believe. So, in the interim time, we've had just a few blue ribbon commissions and a few studies that have been worked on. And, and I think all of us would agree that we are in a lot better place than we were. I mean, we've had a lot of success. And what I got to do is look at graduation rates, we look at, at expectations of student performance. I taught high school in 1973, and the math requirements of 1973 were ninth grade math and consumer mathematics, and that was it. That's all kids do. And I can tell you, I talked to both of those classes, and in terms of being prepared to do anything with mathematics, students were not prepared when they left. So we have really ratcheted up at least the expectation of content and rigor that our students are expected to know. And if you look at the generations of testing that we've gone through, our very first uh, in the grade in the course test, you know, and then we went through basically a re-standardization process, um, and our kids have, have actually responded very well in some of those arenas. But anyway, um, I do. I, if, 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 if you take a look at, at who is sort of con, sort of a person that is a great sort of assimilates what's going on in this country, well, my, probably my favorite author is easy to read um, is Thomas Friedman. And Thomas Friedman has written a bunch of books, and it's five or six. I, I have read three. I read, uh, you know, um, in fact, as a part of almost, I suspect, um, I suspect almost every single one of you read The World is Flat, it's part of the American Web course at some point. Great books on national bestseller list for about a year and a half is a great book. I mean, it's one of my favorite books. I've used it as a seminar in a student group. I've been mean, using it for three years in a row. All our principals read it when we talked about it. 
Um, the second book I read was Hot, Flat, Crowded, which is an absolutely great book. A lot of environmental issues, particularly. And the book he's most recently written is called That Used to Be Us. It's about six, seven, about eight months ago. And the subtitle of that book is How America Fell Behind in the World and Invented It, How We Can Come Back. He co authored the book with a, 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 a man named Michael Bender. And so their title came from a November 2010 quote from President Obama. It says, it makes no sense for China to have a better rail system than us, and Singapore having better airports than us. And we just learned that China now has the fastest supercomputer on Earth. That used to be us. So Freeman and Mandelbaum talk about what are the big challenges in America has to do. So number one, we have to adapt to globalization. We have to adjust technology and revolution, and we have to cope with a large and soaring budget deficit, and we have to manage a world of both rising energy consumption and rising climate threats. Well, his, his discussion of uh, basically the balancing the budget and, and essentially the uh, uh, budget shortfalls and certain deficits is fascinating. In the presidential election year, I'd encourage you to read it. I'm not going to talk about it today, but he disagrees with Democrats, he disagrees with Republicans, and they both have to agree about both the authors of but I, am, I do want to turn and talk a little bit about globalization, a little bit about the technology part as it affects education, and a tiny bit about the environmental issue. But this example that, if, you, if you've read his work, you know, I mean, you've read the world's flat, he gives lots of examples from his travels around the world, some newspaper comments from your writer. And he gives an example of an American company called Applied Materials. And it's an example of how a combination of globalization, technology, and energy management is impacting. And so Applied Materials is a company in the Silicon Valley in California, of course. And Applied Materials makes machines that produce sophisticated thin fiber solar panels. In 2010, the company opened the largest sophisticated thin panel uh, um, solar, solar uh, excuse me, the largest commercial solar research and development center in Xi'an, China, and received 26,000 Chinese applications for their 200. 60 jobs. When they got through hiring, 31% of the people they hired had a master's or PhD degree. It says so the, the company spokesman said 50% of the solar panels in the world were made in China last year, and we need to be where our customers are. Now just think for a moment if Applied Materials opened this solar panel research company <laughs> in North Carolina or South Carolina. What would the applicant pool have looked like? Would there have been 26,000 applicants with 31% of them with master's and doctor's degrees? I don't know. I doubt it. We probably all say, I doubt it. I think you all know, let me ask you this question. How many, what do you think the earnings of the 330 people, 260 people that they hired in Xi'an, China, do you think they're earning more or less than Americans? They're earning less because they're working for a lot less. And it used to be, I have a number of friends in Haines Brand. It used to be Sarah Lee. Haynes Brands now, basically a Fortune 100 company. Do they manufacture much in the United States anymore in, in textiles? No, they don't. They manufacture almost all of it is exclusively in uh, Central America um, and, and in South America. Because uh, one of my friends is traveling there all the time. And so, so that's, a, I mean, that's an unbelievable switch. So that's what it used to be. Manufacturing was only about we had cheaper labor. Well, now you get not only cheaper labor, but higher skilled labor. So you got higher skilled and cheaper labor other places. And, and then we have government regulation that goes on top of it. Before you out here, the Haines Brain guys talk about their number one competitors in Canada, making socks. And they said, you know, let me tell you, the cost of doing business in the United States is really tough. So, um, great example. Hey, let me talk a little bit about, this is a great piece of little quote from Freeman Spray. He said, when he wrote the, he wrote the World's Flat in 2005. And he commented he wrote the flat, he said, the world's now flat. He said, Facebook was not even in his book. He says, Twitter was still a sound. He said, clouds were in the sky. Applications what you filled out to apply for a job. And Skype was a typo. He said, none of those things. So he talks about technology. And he says, soon, you know, you know technology, everybody's going to have the tools and the tools. And right now, in business and in schools and education, technology isn't about it. I mean, there are has and have Quite frankly, some of the you know, companies that are successful are successful because of the great technology and the innovations of technology. 
But basically, these guys say essentially everybody's going to have access to this, this technology. And then it's going to be what's going to make the difference in whether you're successful or not. And he quotes a, a, a gentleman named uh, Joel Crowley, who's the vice president for strategy for IBM. And he says, once all the technology is a given, he says, all the old fashioned stuff will matter more. How good is your school system? How well have you trained your workers? What kind of creativity, inspiration, and imagination will they bring to the platform? How good is your rule of law, your natural, your, excuse me, your national government, governments, and how smart are your regulatory, patent, and tax policies? These will be the real differentiators, not the technology. Technology will cease to be a differentiator. So as we start thinking about preparing people for work, um, he said that's the only way we're going to be better. Worse than anything, he talks about different kinds of jobs. He puts them into uh, um, he puts them into four pretty simple categories. He says uh, it's essentially jobs are people who are creating, or jobs who are in the service, service creating and your service. And then he says there are really creative creators, and then there are sort of routine creators. And he says there are sort of creative routine job people, and then there are just routine routine people. And he gives examples of all those different. Occupation. You have the, you know, you have the really the, 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 the lead attorney in some sophisticated, complicated patent case, you know. But within that, so he's the creative creator. But you've got another creator, another lawyer doing all this grunt work, you know, he's doing all these other kinds of things. And, and he also talks about in the routine sector, a creative routine person might be um, uh, a CNA in a nursing home, you know, a, a nursing assistant, certified nursing assistant, a nursing home, you know, who takes care of elderly patients. But they are they really can relate to older patients and their families. And they serve them so well that you know they're they are absolutely in high demand and people love them. And so it's they're that kind of folks, and then they're the folks, you know, that you know, instead of the mechanic that, that changes engines and fixes the huge problems, it's a guy who's just the oil changing guy. That's kind of the routine, routine folks. But it gives a great example of how, how the world is changing. And he uses he uses the, the legal profession. He said back in 1978, there was one of these great big lawsuits. Six million documents that had to be looked at and discovered. So you have this fleet of lawyers. Lawyers go out, and it costs $2.2 million for lawyers to look at six million documents. There's actually now a piece of software called e discovery software. He said there was a similar lawsuit in 2011, similar. 1.5 million documents needed to be examined. They were examined with a legal cost of $100,000. So if you compare the six million and one half million instead of two point two million, you're spending four hundred thousand dollars. So that's a huge difference. So the, the kind of the, the guy that's sort of the routine creator, the lawyer who sort of does the grunt work, you know, they're 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 gonna be their jobs are in jeopardy in the future. So we're really looking at how do we create creative people. And so Freeman Monolon, they interviewed a whole bunch of people across the country and said, Well, what do you need? What are you looking for? And he summarized it in this short thing. says they are, this is what business is looking for. They're looking for workers who can think critically and can tackle non-routine, complex tasks and who can work collaboratively with teams located in their office or, with, uh, or is somewhere else. In other words, locally. So if we ask ourselves, do our kids do this well when they graduate from us? And we, we'd offer some qualifications. Certainly some do. But probably as a general answer, general rule, we'd probably say no. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to prepare people for this global economy? Kind of well, we had a little discussion about, about common, common core standards. I think probably in, in taking a look at common core standards, you all would agree that particularly new standards are, are certainly more rigorous, and particularly assessments. I'm, I, I'm sort of interested in our, our, our time here. I'm not going to really go over the details, but I, I have a, if you really read it great, since I'm sure you probably read summaries for some of our folks from the business. School. They want to just look at the Hunt Institute online. They have some great summaries of a recent business conference brought business leaders together uh, this spring, um, and they actually have great descriptions of kind of what's happening in language arts. It's kind of it's kind of really taking a look at. We're not we're not doing away with literature, but we really are focusing on answering questions from the text. And we are talking about public speaking, and uh, Dr. Zay's talking about that, uh, public speaking, writing skills, and we're really talking about understanding text and using it to make convincing arguments about something. Um, and in mathematics, we narrowed our focus into many fewer standards instead of this sort of, you know, we offer an all right inch deep curriculum. Um, so the question is, are those standards going to change the structure? And, and I think that 
probably the assessment system will really make a difference. And if you have not looked on the Smarter Balance website, um, we're a part of the Smarter Balance Consortium. South Carolina is, North Carolina is, and 26 other states, 28 states in the Smarter Balance Consortium. Um, we had an administrative retreat with our administrators last week, and we actually pulled out, I pulled out about, ooh, about five or six sample problems, um, three or four in language arts, and a couple in mathematics um, to take a look at. And, and they were they were they're, they're challenging. And I asked our you know I asked our, our, our principals particularly I said, well, how prepared do you think our teachers are to, to have students perform this way? And they said not too prepared. And I said, well, it's just you know and, and our middle and high school folks said, well, you know our integrated math teachers got got a good background because integrated math is taught basically as a problem based learning exercise. And many of you have had problem based learning kind of in fact the Wake Forest Medical School. Wake Health Medical School now, they started training about 15 years ago every single person in problem based learning. They have like, you know, you're learning about this disease, this thing, this thing, this thing. You basically start the case studies and you learn your medicine through the case studies. And that problem based learning approach is exactly what we need, which gets at what Dr. Rice said facilitating learning for teachers. That's a critical issue. Um, so uh, I'm jumping around in my notes because I, I look at my watch. Um, so essentially, we have these new standards and new assessments that will come to the And I feel like the rigor has been ratcheted up. Well, in North Carolina, we have actually added. In North Carolina, we've actually asked a lot of other things than just reading the maps. I mean, we teach a whole bunch of things. We teach arts, we teach BE, and we teach social studies. And we teach uh, career technical education courses. But we have vocats in career technical education. But we, a whole bunch of our courses we don't. So North Carolina has made a commitment creating common exams in each of those courses. 800 teachers have been involved across our state. Um, they're actually rolling out this year. And they're not going to be rolled up in state report. But there will be a common exam, for example, for world history. There will be a common exam for Americans. There will be a common exam you know, for, for fourth grade you know, social studies. And essentially, students, most of those tests will be multiple choice. They will be scored locally and locally looked at locally. And it will be a part of the teacher evaluation system because it's race at the top. Our state is committed to using teacher performance as a part of the evaluation system. So those are going to meet that requirement. But what if you're teaching art or art, you know, in chorus, and you're the band, the band instructor, or you're the elementary music teacher, we're actually going to have performance rubrics. We're going to use performance rubrics in that, and we'll actually score those because so they can actually be used as a part of that performance assessment system. So everybody is going to have some sort of assessment, and I think that is, that is really positive. So um, if I return back to, uh, if, we are, if we're able to achieve proficiency um, on, uh, on our common core test and certainly on our common exams, the question is, you know, well, how are we going to get there? And it's, what's it going to take to do it? And, and Thomas Freeman and, and Mandelbaum talk about that, and they, they say, well, certainly, we have to have, you know, well-trained teachers. Degree in teaching number one, principles number two. But what else do we need? And, and what they, they have, a, let me see if I can find this quote, they, they suggest that we need to have parents who are more motivated and demanding of their children's education. So we need politicians you know, who, are, who are championing you know, high standards, you know, championing the standards. Really. We need neighbors who are willing to work with schools even though they don't have any kids attending school. Our overpopulation, you all know it's about it. And for sight, 70% of the population of children in schools. You know, so you know, we have a lot of grandparents that are out there and moving around, essentially, you know, there's a lot of taxpaying folks who don't have any association in school. So we have to somehow know that engage them. Um, and then we have to have business leaders who are committed to raising standards and to supporting schools. And that's part of our relevance piece and bringing those together. And then he says, you can't leave out students. I love Freeman's comments. You've got to have students who come to school prepared to learn, not to text. They've got to be ready to learn, not to text. So he says, do you think I've included everybody in the book? He says, well, sure I have. And this is a great quote that's echoed by another person who suggested many. He says, our educational challenge is too demanding for the burden to be borne by teachers and principals alone. It's everybody. This is a community activity. I read a book just really recently. I, in fact, I only read my got in our local foundation. Uh, it's actually on a data max of 
Foundation. And, and they actually sent a group of people to the Gallup uh, Foundation, Gallup, and told the folks. And they got a copy of uh, the, the, the uh, CEO of Gallup, his name is Jim Clifton. And he just wrote a book um, that's actually called Coming Jobs. It has one short chapter, it was about 15 pages, on education. The title of the chapter um, is K-12 Schools Where Entrepreneurs Are Created. And he, he just uses Gallup research and he says, he says, Gallup has found that kids drop out of school when they lose hope to graduate. He says, students lose hope of graduating because they don't feel excited about what's next in their lives. He says, the moment they feel that despair about what's coming next, they start psychologically dropping out of school. And if, they're not, if there's not an intervention and they're not rescued, they're gone. And uh, I actually had an opportunity a long time ago in my dissertation to study dropping out of school, kids that were in school and out of school, um, sort of predictability, you know, what variables actually predict dropping out of school. And this issue of belonging and feeling apart and looking at the future and having hope is critical. Um, a book I read about almost 20 years ago, um, but I read by Cornell West, Race Matters. It's a great book. It's got very, I mean, very high-level sort of academic work. Um, but it really talks about what's happening in this loss of hope, particularly among young African Americans 20 years ago. And he talks about how race is one of the factors that actually enters into this absence of hope. And what's hard for us, not a single person in this room can understand what an absence of hope is having no hope. That, we, we can't conceive of that. If you weren't grown up basically middle class, you just do not conceive of no hope. So this whole issue of how we engage kids, so what, what Clinton says, the Gallup poll, of course, now, Gallup, Gallup's got a couple surveys to help. They, got, they have a survey, they actually have this little, little book, a little 20 question, they call it the Pro Bono Survey, that actually gives you a little pulse of how your kids are thinking. And it asks a lot of questions like, if there's an adult that school cares about you, that's actually it's a question we've used on a survey a number of times. And then he has another thing called the Hope Index. And actually, we've looked at the Hope Index before it's a pretty crisis survey. But it gives you an orientation for kids wanting to go to work. So we believe these are kind of your litmus test of, of talking about your community. But what he says, how do you do this? He says, you have to engage. He said, the solution is local. This is not a national issue. You've got to solve this issue locally. And you've got to have every person from your mayor, from your, you know, your County Commission Chair, that every you know, person to your business leaders talking about education is what's important, is what's important, and we have to work on this engagement with students. He said teachers are most important for teaching the principals, and they deal with a whole lot of the content, and they support the child, and outside of school, there have to be other people. And he says everyone, every child, I think he kind of lose this chapter, every child needs a mentor. And I can tell you, we've had a mentoring program um, um, in Versailles that's actually actually worked, worked really well. Uh, we started looking at our dropout profile, and we found that, that basically we had a whole bunch of seniors dropping out of school. This was like six years ago, we had about 1,000 kids that dropped out of school. Well, 250 of them were seniors. How can you be a senior and see graduation when you don't own the horizon and drop out of school during your senior year? And we said, how can that be? So we said, what if we find, what if we get some mentors just to work with these kids? So we started a little pop, took, got 25 volunteers, and we took 25 kids in one high school who needed every credit to graduate. As, as a group, you got to have every credit to graduate in order to be successful. So they had to pass everything. So we got a little group of 25, 90% of them graduate. We've expanded that group up there. I think this year we had 175 mentors working with kids. Because again, 9 out of 10 kids graduate. Our number of seniors dropping out of school, I believe this year, we dropped from this 2, 42, 32, 35. We dropped down like 130. We have cut that in half. Seniors dropping out of school. And we've had early nine grade been involved, and they got big brothers and big sisters, and they got a training program, and then they got summer camps for kids making the transition from five to six, and summer camps for kids making the transition from eight to nine, and our schools are high poverty. They're spending about 800000 bucks a year to make the work. So we are all working together. And over four years, our graduation rate is going from 70.8%, this year it's 80.9%, 10% is. And a lot of that is just sort of thinking, it's what Clifton's talking about, engagement with kids and focus to solve sort of simple problems, standing for us in the parents. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to be quick on this one, but it's, it, it's something that I think holds a lot of promise. 
uh, by accident, our administrator, we, we were looking for a consultant to help the organization work. I, I didn't even come to the organization. I didn't even do that. We actually found uh, there's a, web, a website, we found a website, the Society Organization Learning Education Partnerships. I sound like the bills. We started looking into them. Some of you are familiar, I suspect, with uh, uh, Peter Simmons' work, System Work. In fact, there's a book called Schools of Learning. In fact, the new edition of that was, if you're familiar with it, the new edition is about to come out. So we, the, every year they have a thing you should call it a gathering. There are small groups um, that we get together once a year. And it was a pretty small, loose knit, but, but kind of small group. And we started going into that. We said, in fact, we got some of our local foundations to pay for groups to go. And we've been five years to this, uh, this, uh, this summer that they've been. It's actually grown from like about 300 people there last year. In fact, we're hosting it next year. Uh, we're actually going to host this uh, actually. It's a literally a systems thinking for kids you know, kind of workshop. And it has kids in the workshop. One thing that Peter Sidney believes in is that you have to have the voice of the students. You have kids that look at the, at the trainings also, um, which is about intergenerational learning and, and talking. But we're actually working on a program that's called it's the 13 Habits of a Systems Thinking. 13 Habits. And they are, they, in fact, we all, if we, we all say systems thinking, we say, well, yeah, we think that's important, but if we were on the elevator and we said, well, what is systems thinking, we'd probably give all kinds of different answers to what is systems thinking. Um, if, you ask, uh, if you ask Peter Sandman, he says it's a toolbox for life. He says you've got to understand that your actions influence everything and everything. And this is about how everything literally is interconnected. Now, that's real global. But these habits of the system thinker work is really good because one of, one of them is for kids to understand what happens in perspective, understanding perspective. So they learn these simple graphs called behavior over time graphs. Time is down here and behavior. So in literature, for example, or the stories they read, they say, well, what, you know, what's, you know, you know, Johnny started out, what do you are happy to say? And he started out happy, there were some bad things happened in the course of the story of the book, but he solved his problems and he ended up over here. So he started out happy, he got sad, he got, you know, you, you can, there are all kinds of things like you can do behavior in the playground, you can do behavior at lunch, you can do, how tired were you during the, when did you learn best today? You know, start of the day, well, you know, I was really awake in the morning and then I got tired and then I got after lunch and we played and I got a little bit better or whatever. So you learn these behavior over time frames. It's a, it's a way of thinking. I was looking at the, remember I mentioned the common core examples, the smarter balance examples. There's a smarter balance example. It's a picture of a graph. Time on the bottom and 400 meters. It's a distance. And it's, it's a race, a hurdle race, 400 meter hurdle race. And it basically shows a graph of kids, I mean, of runners running. So it's nothing but the graph, and you see this, it goes up, it's got this really steep, and then it gets real flat, goes over. And so the problem for the student is, you're the commentator for this race. Use this graph to describe what happened in the race. And so it's clear that the guy that's starting out the fastest obviously hit a hurdle or something because he stopped and it got very flat, and then picked back up and finished last race. And these other two, what's happened, they're very close. Who ended up finished first was on a short period of time, 400 meters was the mark. It's a behavior over time graph. We, we have second graders, in my opinion, who can take that smarter balance problem and do it without any trouble. There's a whole bunch of other ones that, that's a, that the 13 habits range from understanding the big picture, understanding that time makes a big difference in cause and effect. And we, we talk about you know, our states get ready to experiment with some major calendar change, another calendar. And in it, five years from now, you know, there's a period out, what is the cause and effect? What is going to be the ramifications of that five years from now? You know, we, we've had short budget shortfall, we've done very little training, we didn't have much training in the last four years, we didn't have any money. What is going to be the cost of that, you know, five years from now? You know, what, what are those time delay issues? What, how do you deal with unanticipated consequences? What, what does that mean? Um, and how do you look for key leverage points to solve problems? And I'm going to talk a little more about that, but I will tell you this. Is working on a project um, right now with uh, actually Michael Fulton, my manager, my actually is going to work last summer and they're working together over here. And they've submitted a proposal to the Hewlett Foundation in California, and, and actually the title of their, of their work, and they're, this is literally just, just happening right now. Um, I'm going to find it. Um, actually, I can't. But the title actually has to do with, uh, it actually has to do with using the common core standards to improve deeper learning 
kids. So, so Peter Sinkin's view, the Common Core is what is kind of is, is something we need to ratchet on rigor and the, the kind of thinking that goes on to solve problems. As he believes. In fact, the great present he's the best facilitated learner you know, as a presenter I've ever seen. Literally speaks for about three, or four, or five minutes. Basically, you have both groups of three and four and talk about issues and come back. He's, he's a really fascinating guy. Um, so anyway, that's on the horizon. I want to end by, I actually read, uh, um, I think you know, Jim Collins has written, written a lot of books, and, and particularly, uh, um, I think most good to great, most people great, good to great. But there's a whole series of them. In fact, the, the four of them he wrote was built to last, from good to great, out of mighty fall, and, and great by, by choice. Great by George Jim Collins, it's about a year and a half old. And I closed our retreat with this, these two paragraphs from, from the book. And I want to close the day, and we might look at this. Um, the, the two paragraphs are quite to sort of, sort of move us forward as we think about the future. And uh, it's kind of resonating with me. It says, When the moment comes when you're afraid, exhausted, or tempted, what choice do we make? Do we abandon our values? Do we give in? Do we accept average performance because that's what most everyone else accepts? Do we capitalize to the, me, do we capitulate to the pressure of the moment? Do we give up on our dreams when we've been slammed by real facts? The greatest leaders we've studied throughout all our research cared as much about values as victory, as much about purpose as profit, as much about being useful as being successful. They drive and their drive and standards are ultimately internal, rising from somewhere in the inside. We are not imprisoned by our circumstances. We are not imprisoned by the luck we get or the inherent unfairness of life. We are not imprisoned by crushing setbacks, self-inflicting mistakes, or our past success. We are not imprisoned by the times in which we live, by the number of hours in a day, or even the number of hours we are granted in our very short lives. In the end, we can control only a tiny sliver of what happens to us. But even so, we are free to choose and free to choose, free to become great by choice. Last two paragraphs of free to become great by choice. And I think this common core standards, what we're working on, facilitative learning and training. I have a whole section on PLCs, how important PLCs are, and we've got to trust, we've got to be open, we've got to work together, we've got to learn how to listen. And it takes a lot of training, a lot of work. The next two years, I'm here in town for a seat. So thanks for asking me. If you notice on the schedule, Dr. Mark will continue that discussion with the President Center of Leadership uh, in the session after lunch. We have guides out front that help you get over to the cafeteria back. Um, boy, I'm going to take an administrative role here and extend this time uh, until 12, uh, 12.45. So we'll add 15 minutes to that schedule. That means those of us presenting in the first session after lunch will be a little flexible getting back on it. If we have to, we'll extend everything along with Salt Lake that day here. We certainly appreciate our speakers being here this morning. Uh, I'd like to give them another round of applause. of the principles that we're trying to incorporate into our training with you here. I do appreciate that a great deal. Uh, when we come back after lunch, we'll also be down with the principalship uh, focus on the room to my left and the curriculum focus on my room uh, on the room to the right. Here in the center will be the executive track. Uh, Dr. Benamor, is he with the students right now? Dr. Benamor is the dean of uh, school, Godwell School of Business will be directed this session here. Well, you have a choice. Just because we're educators doesn't mean you don't choose the executive track. If something attracts you or if you're an executive track, you'll see something you're doing in Brickley area or Lipsham area, that's great too. So we'll see you back here in an hour and 10 minutes. Best.